August. Of course, we have a lot of people away and people that are traveling, and so we want to keep those folks in prayer. It's good to see some of you back, and uh, I'm sure others of you will be going as well here in the next few weeks. I hope you get your time away, and I hope that you can uh, uh, enjoy some vacation time. And then we are looking forward to September. So September the 8th is what we're calling our Back to Church Sunday. So that, for you, means a couple of things. Number one, uh, on September the 8th, we want you to be here. Number two, we want you to be praying about that. Kids are back, people are back, and uh, we're looking forward to our fall schedule of things. It also means that uh, a lot of our small groups will begin that week. So you'll be hearing about groups, you'll be seeing uh, uh, slides about groups and text messages, um, and uh, I hope you'll get connected with a group. And if you are not, it's really a great way to meet some people, it's a great way to kind of grow in your faith, and there are options all throughout the week, and then there's some options even on Sunday. So that'll all start the week of September 8th, I hope you'll be a part of that. And uh, we're praying and looking forward to a good fall. We're also going to have um, communion in September, so uh, missionary in September, so a lot of upcoming events. So uh, I, I know you'll be excited about that. So be praying on that. Uh, also wanted you to know uh, that the group from Guyana, our missions team, uh, they are flying home today. So they're flying home right now as we speak uh, and they left at 5 o'clock this morning, flew to Miami, and then Miami, they'll be in sometime tonight. But a uh, great week from everything I was told. As a matter of fact, our missionary, Greg Mann, texted me this morning and just said that the group did an amazing job, uh, represented the church, represented the Lord well. Um, they had a great week of camp. They were way up by, uh, by the Venezuelan border. Uh, they had a big group of teenagers that came, some from hours away, and uh, next Sunday, you're going to get an update. Brother James, uh, all those who went, uh, you're going to see video and pictures and hear testimonies, and they're going to tell you uh, how great a trip it was, but a little uh, encouraging word, um, I was told this morning that there were 26 teenagers who trusted Christ as their Savior this week, and yeah, that was great. And on top of that, no fooling around, 23 of them went down to the river and got baptized, which was great. So it was a good thing. So, uh, so you'll get to hear that and see that next week. So whatever you do, make sure you're here. If you're in town, make sure you're here. You'll enjoy seeing that. And uh, nothing like going somewhere else to realize, uh, you know, sometimes what we have and uh, what, how we take that for granted also just kind of opens your heart and, um, and, uh, and eyes and uh, gives you some clarity on some things. So I'm glad the gospel works, not just in New York City. It works all around the world. So thank you for praying. Missionary uh, Greg Mann said, please tell the church, thank you for your sacrifice, your prayers. Many of you gave, and uh, you had a part in that. So it was a good week. So we look forward next week uh, to hearing from uh, them. For those of you who've been at All Nations, I was going to say old timers, I'm a, for those of you who've been in All Nations for a, for a long time, um, uh, John and Joy Gibson, mo we all know, but many of you, many of you know their son, Zach, Zach Gibson. Uh, today, Zach Gibson um, is getting ordained. And so Zach grew up in this church, and then when we started Shalom Baptist, he was the right-hand man for his mom and dad, went off to Bible college, and got married, and He's uh, on staff at a church in Minnesota, and today is uh, his ordination, and so the Gibsons are there, but uh, it's a proud moment and a highlight, and uh, he texted me just a few minutes ago, said, tell the church thank you for their part in my life, and so if you know Zach, be praying for him today, a uh, special day for sure. So it's great to see um, how God uh, works in people's lives. Uh, like, uh, the interns said to... Uh, Big thank you, uh, Antonio and Conrad. They got where they needed to be, getting ready to start school. You guys gave a love offering, big love offering for them to help them, and they were just really overwhelmed. Said to thank you so much for that. Matthew and Mary Candithill made it to North Carolina, 
uh, this week. I talked to her a few days ago, said to just tell the church thank you for your prayers. So, you know, God moves people uh, and brings other people in, and uh, that's just how it goes. And I'm glad he's kind of in charge of all of that. Uh, but uh, I'm glad that we have a connection through Christ, and that's a good thing. So just a little update on some things um, that have been happening, and so I uh, just wanted you to know. Uh, today, uh, I want us to remember to pray for our missionaries of this week, and I'm, we're just going to put their picture there. So I'm not going to mention their names since this is on uh, live stream, uh, and their picture will be blocked out. But they are in a communist country and uh, they are very much at risk um, doing what they do. And so you see their names, and please pray for them. They've been there many years, been extremely faithful, and uh, doing a great job. And so if you don't remember to keep them in prayer, I know they would appreciate it so much. Also, many of you asked about Philip and Rachel Wild, and again, I'm not gonna, you know where they are. Um, and that country has had some tremendous unrest in the last several weeks. Uh, and twice in the last month, he got word to me, but they've been without internet for weeks uh, and kind of under martial law, can't be out of the house, but a couple hours a day. But uh, I was told this week all their leadership fled the country. So um, it's in a transition time right now where they are. So just pray there's some new leaders in that country country, and it'll be favorable for them to remain there. So pray for the wilds, but they wanted everybody to know that they're doing okay. So we need to pray for all of our missionaries, those people all around the world doing some uh, the work of the Lord, and keep them in your prayers if you would. Uh, it's good to have Mercy back uh, today. She had major surgery, and she's back in her place today. <clears throat> so uh, we're thankful that she is. Glad to have guests with us today as well. I know Martin's here, and we have some other guests and uh, we're really glad that uh, uh, they're here as well. And I hope you'll go by and introduce yourself to them. How many of you have a burden, just something you're praying about in your heart today? Okay. Uh, let's bow for prayer. Can we do that today? Lord, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to be in church. And, uh, Lord, uh, we know uh, we're right in the middle of the month of August. And so, Lord, I know a lot of folks are away and traveling. And I pray you'd bless them and keep them safe, help people to get the rest that they need and to bring them back. Lord, as we think ahead for fall and pray that you'll just uh, continue to bless your church and, Lord, your ministry here. And, uh, Lord, I pray that you would uh, just uh, continue to allow us to see people saved and, and baptized and growing in, in you, Lord. And we're just thankful for your many, many blessings to us. Lord, we want to pray uh, that you would uh, today uh, definitely, Lord, uh, be with uh, uh, our missionaries. Lord, we want to pray for um, the ones that um, we put on the screen, and you know who they are, and we pray for their protection, their safety. Pray that you continue to grant wisdom so that they can continue to minister where they are. And I'm always encouraged to hear the reports about men and women coming to faith in you. And so, Lord, I do pray that you would bless them in a very special way and their family and help them to know they have brothers and sisters here in New York that are praying for them. Also for the wilds, Lord, keep your hand upon them in this time of transition, not only for their family, but in, in that country. I just pray that, again, you'll grant wisdom, help them as they're learning the language, and uh, just uh, pray that you would use them in a great way. Protect them, keep them safe, Lord. Uh, we do ask that you'll do that. Pray for all of our missionaries as well today. Lord, we want to pray for our country. We pray for our leaders to come to faith in you. And Lord, that uh, when they know you, then you can work in their lives. And we do pray that uh, those biblical truths, uh, Lord, would be followed and would be practiced by our leaders. And Lord, we pray for revival in our country. Uh, Lord, uh, help us as believers to do all that we should do to point people to you. Lord, we want to pray as well uh, for Israel today and, and uh, her leaders. And Lord, again, we're praying that through everything that is happening, that both Jew and Gentile would seek you and that, Lord, they would come to you. And that's our prayer as well uh, for Israel and for uh, the Palestinians. We pray for, for all the nations, Lord. Help them to, to seek you and be saved. Lord, we want to pray for each person who raised a hand today. We know that those hands represent burdens and needs and requests. 
uh, things that are heavy on people's heart. And I'm glad, I'm grateful that you are our hope. Lord, uh, you invite us, uh, you implore us to come and talk with you about uh, these things in our life. And I pray, Lord, that we'll trust you uh, as we should and that your will, your way would continue to take place in us. And Lord, I, I just pray that you would help us to be faithful. Lord, if there's a man, woman, boy, or girl here today that does not know you as Savior, let today be the day that uh, uh, he or she, Lord, will put their trust in you, recognize their need, and that, Lord, their life would be changed forever. We pray for that. Lord, uh, we're glad for our guests being here today and encourage them, we pray. Uh, Lord, bless our offering as people give in a little while today that uh, they'll give generously, sacrificially as you have for us and you would bless them and use it to meet the needs here and around the world. Lord, we just pray in all things, as we pray, as we sing, as we uh, give, as we open your word, I just pray, Lord, that you'll be honored and glorified today. God, we love you. And uh, we say thank you for your blessings. So continue to bless as we worship you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's stand. Let's continue to worship him in song. Praise the Lord. Sing with me. His mercy is more Stronger than darkness New every morn Our sins, they are many His mercy is more What love could remember the wrongs we have done omniscient all-knowing he counts not their sum thrown into a sea without bottom or shore our sins they are many his mercy is more what patience what patience would wait as we constantly roam? What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. of kindness he lavished on us his blood was a payment his life was the cost we stood near the debt we could never afford our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the Sing it in a go. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more stronger than darkness. New every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. 
Our sins, they are many, His mercy is The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In green pastures he makes me lie down. He restores my soul and he leads me. Let's sing that again. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. In green pastures he makes me lie down. He restores my soul and leads me on for his name. For his great name. Surely goodness, surely mercy, right beside me all my days. And I will dwell in your house forever. he does in the presence of my enemies though the arrow flies and the terror of night is at my door I'll trust you Lord surely good Surely mercy, right beside me all my days, and I will dwell in your house forever, and bless your home. Let's sing that again, surely goodness. Surely goodness, surely mercy, right beside me all my days, and I will dwell in your house forever, and bless your shadow of death, I will fear no evil, and even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are on my side. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death,
Surely goodness, surely mercy, right beside me all my days, and I will dwell in your house forever, and
Father God, great is your faithfulness, truly. You have sent your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose precious blood, Lord, all sins were forgiven, Lord. And because he lives, we shall live as well. Lord, bless Pastor as he speaks, Lord, from your word, the only word from you, Lord, the Bible, the Holy Bible, oh God, which you have given to us. You have revealed through the prophets and the evangelists, Lord, all these good things that we are to know, Lord. Lord, we pray for a fruitful service, Lord, a fruitful harvest. And for the one who hasn't heard, oh God, we pray that he hears this day. We pray that the one who came in here, Lord, not thinking that God loved them and God had a plan for their lives, Lord, that they know it for sure after this day and that it's not for no reason that they have been brought into this place to hear your word. We thank you, Lord, for all these things. Lord, blessed are you. And we pray in the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Please be seated. All right. Thank you to everybody uh, helping with worship, all of our musicians, and Ryan, thanks to everybody back in the sound booth and on the media and the camera. Uh, big help. They make everything roll right along, and we are very grateful for that. We're really glad you're here. Uh, if you just got in here, quick announcement. After the service, they're having a funeral, so if you parked in the funeral home, they just asked that we be out by 1. So I promise I'll stop preaching by 12.59 and give you a minute to get down to where you need to be. And uh, there should be no problem. But I told them I would, uh, would say something. Also, be praying. Um, a lot of our uh, young people are heading off, heading to college uh, the next few weeks. And so I know today's Jonathan's uh, last Sunday here. Uh, and my daughter's heading out. Uh, the interns left last week, uh, Hannah Gibson. So we've got folks going out of state, so uh, keep them in prayer if you would uh, as well. Psalm 13 today. Psalm 13, I don't know if you've ever had your life change quickly uh, in an unexpected fashion. I would imagine that many of us have. And sometimes you have questions, and questions aren't always a bad thing. Uh, but when you can't seemingly find the answers to those questions, uh, it's, you struggle at times. Uh, psalm 13 is uh, one of these psalms that's short in nature. Uh, it was penned by the man named David. Um, and most of us have heard of David, know some things about David. And David wrote quite a few of the psalms. And, in, and it's great. The Bible tells us that uh, all of Scripture was written for our edification, for our learning. Paul would say in the book of Romans that everything you read about, all the experiences, all the transparency, that it is meant so that we could benefit, so that we could learn. And hopefully, as you read the Bible, uh, you have that open heart and that open mind to learn some things. David was a man who knew what it was to have struggles in life. If I were to ask you today... You know, how many of you would uh, summarize your life as trouble? There would probably be some of you. Uh, maybe you would say, maybe not my life, but maybe my circumstances right now are filled with trouble. Uh, maybe you're in a good spot right now, and thank God for that. But you know as well as I do that like waves of the sea, trouble comes and trouble goes. Uh, it's in these times of trouble that um, we often have the opportunity to draw close to God. And you see uh, today some um, very clear principles uh, about uh, the, the, the Christian life or the, the walk of faith in times of, of trouble. Uh, David, you remember, was a, a young man when he, he, we're introduced to him. Uh, going back in Israel's history, and I wish we had hours and hours and hours and uh, if you've never read through 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, uh, you should do that. It, it's, an, uh, it's an amazing account uh, with so much truth and uh, so much insight, so much application. We meet this young guy named David. Israel had a king, a man named Saul. But it was very clear that Saul was not God's choice. Saul was the people's choice. And sometimes the worst thing that we can get is that which we want. And they complained and complained and complained, and God said, why would you want a human king? I'm your king. But they wanted him, they wanted him, they wanted him, and God said, fine. And Saul can be your king. But it was very evident that he was the people's choice, not God's. Saul was afraid to do things that he should have done. 
And multiple times, Israel almost lost. Israel almost became enslaved because Saul did not do what he should have done. Saul did many things that he should not have done. He acted in ways which did not honor God. And things progressively became worse and worse and worse. His spirit got hard. He got hard against the Lord. He wasn't close to God. Things became uh, very evident that uh, God's hand was no longer on Saul's life. Until the, the day came when God told prof, the prophet Samuel, uh, I have my choice for king. And I want you to go and anoint the next king. So Samuel goes, and he, you remember he goes to the house of Jesse. There are eight boys, and it's not the first, not the second, not the fifth, not the sixth, not the sixth. It's the last boy, and he's a young man named David. David was God's choice. And it shows you that God had a plan for David. And here's just the reminder, and Brian mentioned it when he was praying, God has a plan for your life. He has always had a plan for your life. His plan includes you being here today. Now, do we always follow his plan? No. Are we always uh, keen and, and, and understanding of what his plan is? No. Uh, but God has a plan. Does it always make sense to us? Absolutely not. But I'm grateful to know that he has a plan for us. So here's this shepherd boy. He's anointed, and this young man is now told he's going to be the next king of Israel. That's a lot of information to come on a, a teenage guy. And he knows he is going to be the king of, of, of God's people someday. But what's interesting is he doesn't let pride go to his head, and he, and he doesn't do what maybe many people would have done and brag about it a lot. As a matter of fact, as you read about his journey as a young man, over and over the statement is made that, that David behaved himself wisely before the Lord. He was a respectful young man. He was teachable. He was learning. He, he, he wanted to be what God wanted him to be, and he wanted to do what God wanted him to do. And as he began to grow, he connects with King Saul, and he gets moved into the palace. This is great. I'm going to learn from the current king on what it means to be a king and what happens in the palace and, 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 and at what, how I'm supposed to act. And he really begins to view Saul as a father figure. And then we know that the big event happens between David and Goliath. And David's not there to show anybody up. He just can't figure out why in the world is no one stepping out by faith to, to honor God. And what happens? God honors that faith. Sometimes you have to have that childlike faith, right? And he steps up and he does what Saul should have done and what others should have done. And a giant is slain. The Philistines run. And there's great victory. And now David goes from just being known by a few people to now being known by everyone. He's uh, the man of the year. Everybody knows who he is. And now he's in the palace, and he's learning, and he's excited. He's going to be the next king. He has God's promise. How, how could life get any better except trouble comes? And that trouble comes in the shape and in the form of King Saul getting jealous. Now you're an enemy, and you're a threat to me. And hatred and bitterness, which we all know that, that, that causes issues. And not once... And not even twice, but multiple times, Saul attempts to murder David. And it comes to a point where David's wife helps him to escape, and he leaves his home, he leaves his wife, he leaves the only upbringing that he knew, and he runs. Not really sure where he's going, not really sure how long this is going to last, not really sure when this whole incident is going to be made right, but that's where he is. His life is now somewhat confusing. His life is upside down. He is living a reactionary life rather than being proactive. And what happens, Saul is not just content for David to be gone. Saul pursues him. Saul has, if I could say it this way, he has the media in town he has the ability to set the narrative, and he's talking bad about David. He's making up things about David. He's telling everybody in Jerusalem that David was trying to kill him, that David is disrespectful, that David would be an awful king, and I'm going to take care of this. 
And David has no opportunity to defend himself. He has no opportunity to set the record straight. And Saul stacks his soldiers and they pursue. And so you find that David is on the run. He's being accused of crimes he didn't commit. And he has to have those low points. And if you've ever read the Psalms, you know he has low points. If you've ever been through trouble, you have low points. You may be a child of God, you may have a spiritual nature, but you live in a body of flesh, just like me. And that flesh has low points. And David, well, I want to do the right thing, I want to keep going, I, I want to do what I'm supposed to do. So even while he's a fugitive, he's helping people. He doesn't get, doesn't get bitter, he doesn't get upset, he, 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 he still helps people in need, and he attracts all these men. I mean... The, by the time it's over, he's got a merry band of, of, of men that are traveling with him, 600 of them. They're ex-cons, they're, they're fugitives themselves, they're anarchists, they're, there were guys who were homeless, who had uh, just no prospect of the future, and, and David takes them in. And now they become his crew. And then, while David is looking over his shoulder every day, not sure what's gonna happen, not sure if Saul will show up, David goes and he helps the Jewish people. If there are people that were struggling or people that needed food, in some cases the Philistines were attacking southern cities, so David took his men and pushed the Philistines back only to have the people he helped contact Saul and say, guess who we saw today? David. He came and helped us out, but we thought you might want to know where he is. And they ratted him out. All of us probably have an understanding of what it is where people we thought had our back and people we thought were going to be there to help us and would support us, and they didn't come through. Not only did they not come through, but, but maybe they intentionally hurt us or betrayed us. So this is David's life. This is where he is. And he does not know how this will be resolved. He has no answers to fix this situation and day by day, he's living very reactionary. He's just waiting for something to happen. And what we are told is that this doesn't just carry on for a few days or a few weeks, a few months or a year, but he is on the run in limbo for 10 years. He cannot go home. He cannot visit his wife. He cannot go back to the tabernacle and worship God. By God's grace, he was able to strike a bargain with the Moabite king in the country next door and get his parents out of Jerusalem so that King Saul wouldn't kill them and, and he put them up and got them asylum there in Moab. And David, as time goes by, has ups and downs, highs and lows. And he gets to this psalm in Psalm 13, and you, you only get the sense that he's in a cave or he's out in the desert. And for a moment, his flesh, his nature is revealed. Notice what he writes in verse 1. How long will thou forget me, O Lord? How long will thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? God, how long? If you're a parent and you've ever taken your children anywhere that was of any distance, you, you understand the question, are we there yet? <laughs> right? You don't mind the first time or the second time, but it's when it becomes ridiculous and when you realize that their logical uh, reasoning is not kicking in. You know, when it is, hey, uh, how much longer? Hey, uh, how, mu how long till we get there? And, and then they ask you 10 minutes later, hey, hey how, how long till we get there? Uh, and you say, it's 10 minutes less than it was the last time that you asked me. And sometimes you get frustrated trying to answer those questions and you can't change anything. 
but you understand why they're asking those questions. I don't want to be in this situation. This is uncomfortable. I want to be where I'm supposed to be. This is not uh, the, the, the method that I have chosen. I want the result, but I don't want the journey. David is, in essence, saying, God, when is this over? When do I have some answers? I, 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 you told me I'm going to be king. I want this to be over. I want to see my wife. I want to be able to go back to Jerusalem and clear my name. I want to be able to go in the tabernacle and worship you. I would like to be the king. I would like to be at peace and not wake up every day looking over my shoulder. I would like to just know what, what's going to happen tomorrow. That would be okay. I, I don't like this journey. Maybe you can relate to that. God, I'm excited about heaven. I'm looking forward to that. I, I really want all your blessings. I, at times, just don't like the journey. Well, you're normal. Notice what he says in verse 3. So God, consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death Lest my enemies say I've prevailed against him. And those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. God, I need you to help me. I need you to do what only you can do. And then I want you to see in verse 5 and 6, all of a sudden, it's like an attitude change. All of a sudden, his perspective is different. Notice, but, but I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord because he had dealt bountifully with me. I mean, you're talking about a slam on the brakes, turn 180 in a drastic shift. And there's no indication here that, you know, days and weeks and months, if not even hours, passed. It, 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 it just all of a sudden as he's talking and as he's thinking and as he's praying with God, what happened? Did God just snap his fingers and everything that was wrong is now made right? Saul's dead, and somebody walks up and hands David an invitation to come back to Jerusalem. Is that what, that, that's not what happened. So what is the transformation? What gets him to back to the point where he says, you know what, I still trust in God's mercy. I'm gonna still thank God, and I'm still gonna praise God, because he has done for me bountifully. I hope you can, with sincere honesty today, say and recognize that God has been bountifully uh, good to you, that God has blessed you. How in the world, when we're going through difficult journeys in life, when we're overwhelmed, how can we come back and conclude, look, I've trusted in your mercy and my heart will rejoice in your salvation. David writes this psalm, he's depressed, he's exhausted, he's uncertain, he's discouraged. And in many ways, you could say he didn't feel like he could go on one more day, one more hour, not one more minute. Maybe you've been there. Have you noticed how quickly time flies when things are going well and how slowly they creep along when we're struggling? We all find ourselves at this same point as David at times. However, he is able to get to this conclusion that I can still trust in God's mercy. See, David was important to God. In case you don't realize this, you are important to God. As a believer, you are a child of God. You belong to him. You're his child. He will be merciful. He will help you. God is our hope. God is our strength. He is merciful and we can trust him. When David says, I have trusted in thy mercy, what does he mean, mercy? We know mercy is not getting what we deserve. But when you look at this word in Hebrew, it is really, uh, it connotes the idea of kindness. We need God's kindness in our life. It connotes the idea of compassion, relief. If you ever needed relief, God, show me some compassion. God, please provide some relief from the stress, the anxiety, from, from 
the circumstances in which my journey is taking me. David said, I am going to trust as I have trusted in your mercy. And when I trusted in your mercy, in your kindness, in your compassion to me, you blessed me bountifully. And I will continue to trust in your, your mercy. David believed at that last final opportunity that God would be merciful to him. And because of that, he learned to trust in God's mercy. You say, why should I trust in the mercy of God? And I think you see a, a, a few realizations, quite frankly, that I think you see in David's own song what led him back to this conclusion, I can trust that God will be merciful and help me. You say, what, what are uh, these realizations? What helps me to trust that God will be merciful? Notice, you can trust in the Lord's mercy when you recognize that God considers you. Notice verse 3. David would pray, God, consider and hear me. O Lord, my God, Jehovah, almighty, all-powerful Elohim, I'm asking you to consider and hear me. And as he's praying and as he's thinking, he comes to this realization. You understand? I get it now, God. You are the only one who will truly consider my life, my circumstances, and, and the condition in which I find myself. The word consider means to scan or to look intently. That David understands in his life, there is no one who is going to look deeply into his life more than God. That there's not anyone else that will understand him and his situation more than God. People are subjective. People work angles. Everybody's flawed. And at times when you reach out and you're saying, look, you got to help me. And please give me some wisdom. Give me some strength. Give me some mercy. And you talk to people. At, at, at best, many of them just don't know what to say. Or they don't have the understanding to really know what's going on in your life. But there is one who knows you better than you know yourself. And it's God. And because that is true, David came to the realization, then if I'm going to trust, I'm going to trust in the one who considers me. He wanted God to see his physical limitations. Notice in verse number uh, th uh, three, he would say, consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. God, I need you to see that I'm struggling here physically. There's many a night, David says, that I, I, I go to sleep and I'm not sure I'm going to wake up the next day. There are many times that I think to myself, I might not make it through the night. And God, I need you to know that. I need you to see that. And I, I can try to explain it to other people, but nobody understands like you understand. He wanted God to see his physical limitations. He wanted God to see the mental and the emotional stress that he had. Notice in verse number two, when he's asking questions, he says, God, how long? How long? Now notice, and you, you get kind of a picture of, 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 of really the state of mind that he's in. How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart every day? In essence, he's saying, look, God, you're absent. I, I don't hear you. I don't see you. And every day I wake myself up, and I'm my best counselor. I have to pull myself up by my own bootstraps. I got to talk myself into things. I have to give myself a pep talk, and I'm brokenhearted. I'm full of sorrow here because of what's happening, and I don't know how much longer I can do this. I don't know how much I can keep talking myself into things. I'm not good emotionally. I'm not good mentally. I need you to see that, but God, here's what I know. Nobody will understand that about me more than you. 
And sometimes people can't understand where we are. They can't understand what we feel. They, they try at times, but they cannot understand like he can understand. And David will come back to that conclusion, God, you are my only hope because you are the only one who will look at this situation objectively and honestly. He wanted God to see his struggles and his battles with his enemies. Verse two, how long shall my enemy be exalted over me? How long? I mean, they're laughing at me. They're getting away with it. I don't have a voice. I, I can't go back and set the record straight. People that I love, people that love me, they think badly about me now because I can't tell them the truth. And even if I could, they don't believe me because the enemy's so powerful. I have no recourse to go and get what God is telling me is mine. I have no other options. The enemy breathes down my neck. And when I try to do right and I try to do well, I get ratted out, I get betrayed, and there is my enemy again. And I don't want them to be enemies. God, but I can't explain this. And I've got a married group of men who want to kill everybody, and I don't want that. But yet, I don't want people to go on believing a lie. And God, I need you to understand. And here's what I realize. You are the only one who can understand. He knows those relationship and interpersonal things that are going on with you and people. He knows when you can't verbalize it and you can't, you can't have a platform to talk to people. He knows how you feel. He knows what you're going through. David realized that God alone would see his life objectively, honestly, and accurately. He realized that though he felt like his trials were going to send him to an early death, he came to the realization that God knew him. God knew where he was. God knew what he was going through. And that God would once again be his salvation. God understands you like no other. He knows what it's like to be misunderstood. He knows what it's like to feel alone. He knows what it's like not to be able to explain all that you face in your life. And he is able to be your salvation. When Jesus was here, he often felt alone. He often was misunderstood. He could not explain what was going to happen where they could understand it. But yet, he provided salvation for us all. Remember these promises. If you don't have these marked, you should mark them in your Bible. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Paul would say this, there is no temptation, no testing taken you. But here's some truths, such as is common to man. I get it. We say this has never happened to anybody before. I don't know. People don't understand. Look, here's what God wants you to know. Nothing new under the sun. So somebody's been through this before, but it's new for you perhaps. But understand, God's not shocked. God's not surprised. God's not on his heels trying to figure out what to do. It's common to man. Here's another truth. But God is faithful. Amen? Great is thy faithfulness. What, what is he faithful? Notice, he is faithful he will not suffer or allow you to be tested above that you are able. Oh, no, it's too much. It's too much. Here, here's the principle. God's not saying, hey, you are invincible and, and you can do it all. God is saying, that, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying to you is I'm not going to allow anything to come upon you and that you have to endure that you and I together cannot walk through. Because what has he said? I will never leave thee. And I will never forsake thee. You and God are a majority. Yea, in him we are more than conquerors. We have been given the victory, the Bible says. There will always be a way of escape that we can bear it. Psalm 139, one of my personal favorite psalms. Verse 1, you begin to see how much God understands you and me. O oh Lord, Jehovah, 
you have searched me and you have known me. You have known my down sitting and mine uprising. You understand my thought afar off. He would go on and say that you know the words in my mouth. That there is not a word in verse 4 in my tongue, but lo, Lord, thou knowest it all together. God, you know me. You know when I sit down. You know when I stand up. You know when I go to the doctor. You know when I pray on my knees. You know when I, I, I am on the bus and on the train. You know when I feel well. You know when I don't. You know what's running through my head. You know how I feel. You know the words that I speak before I speak them. And he would say, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, verse 5. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. And then he would say in verse 6, whither shall I go from thy spirit or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I send up into heaven, whoop, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, whoop, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning or I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. You know me. You're with me. There's no one who is your equal when it comes to understanding me. When no one else understands, God does. Maybe you need God to understand you today. When you cannot explain your hurt, your sorrow, your frustration, your discouragement, God understands. When no one else can help you, he can. And he will be your salvation and your rejoicing. Isaiah 40, and this is another passage of scripture that hopefully you know. If you don't mark it, verse 28 Isaiah would say, wait, 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 hast thou not known? You tell me you didn't know this? Hast thou not heard? You tell me you never heard this truth? That the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. You didn't know that? You didn't know that he never faints, that he never fails, that he never sleeps, he never naps, he never is tripped up, and he's never weary. And did you not know that there is no searching of his understanding? You know, God didn't have to go to the library and, and check out a book to read up on it to figure out what's wrong with you and me. You understand that? There is no searching of his understanding. He understands. When a therapist can't understand, when your best friend can't understand, when your family members can't understand, when the pastor can't understand, God understands. So Isaiah would say, yes, it's true, even the youth shall faint and be weary. So nobody's exempt here in verse 29. And yes, the young men, they will fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. If you will learn to just trust in God's mercy, please understand, Isaiah said, nobody knows you like God. And no matter your age, no matter your demographic, no matter your journey, God knows you and understands. And so David, who is just being super transparent, and he's just showing his weakness, and God, I, I don't know where you are, and I don't know what's going to happen, and how long is this going to happen? As he's praying, as he's thinking, he is reminded, wait a second, I'm asking God to really search me and consider me. And you know what? There is nobody better to do that. No one will do it like he has done it and like he will do it and no one will take up my cause. There is no one that I can ex try to explain to better. There is no one who understands me as much as God. That's why I can trust his mercy. Notice what else David does. Verse three, Psalm 13. Consider me God and he would say and hear me. Oh, Lord, my God. Not once, not twice, but four times in this little excerpt. Four times. David asks a question that he 
doesn't really expect an answer to. How long? How long do I have to live this way? How long until this gets straightened out? How long till I feel better? How long? He felt as though God no longer heard him. If you ever tried to talk to someone and you realize they were not hearing you. They thank God for cell phones, but they only work if people answer them. <laughs> Sometimes I call my kids or family members and they won't pick up. They won't pick up. And I'm thinking, why am I paying for the cell phone bill if they're not picking up their phone? Right? We all want to know at times that we're being heard. Because if not, we get frustrated. That's how David felt. He would say, how long, in verse 1, will you forget me? Oh, Lord, how long? Forever? I mean, that's it? I thought we, I thought we were close. H how long will you hide your face from me? It's like you're not even there. And I need you, but nothing. Or he perceived there was nothing. Right? Don't we say it all the time? Silence does not equal absence. But then he would cry out, Lord, I need you to hear me. And as he reflected, he was reminded, God does hear me like no other. Can I encourage you today? God will hear you when no one else hears you. David allowed his emotions to get the best of him. Well, we've done that, right? God, you forgot all about me. Remember, it was the same David who at a low point in Psalm 142 and verse 4 said, I looked on my right hand and beheld there was no man. Nobody would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. I got no friends, I got no family, I got nobody here to back me up. We're well, taking it a step further now here in Psalm 13. God, it's like you abandoned me. His emotions got the best of him. But do you understand that he's not the only one? But remember, Jesus himself knew what it was to feel forgotten and abandoned by God. The night he's betrayed, he's in the garden, he's there with 11. One of his disciples already betrayed him, right? on his way, but at least these guys are with me, and then he takes three, pray with me, pray with me, and what do they do? They're asleep. What do they do? They're asleep. What are they? They're asleep. And then here comes Judas and the Roman soldiers, and they arrest him, and what happens? His disciples, the guys he's poured into, three and a half, they, they run, they scatter, they deny. And it gets to a point where Jesus is hanging on a cross and he's looking around. Where are the multitudes that listen? Where are the 5,000 and the 4,000 that, that ate when he fed them? Where are the people that he touched and healed them? Where are they? And he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He very well understands what it is to feel like you are alone, but yet you're not. We are told in Hebrews 13, 5, God said, I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. As a matter of fact, we're told in Hebrews 2 that because Jesus himself suffered being tested, he could help us, he could aid us in our times of loneliness. His feelings had brought him low. His enemies had brought him low. And he couldn't make sense of it. But then he comes to the realization that God, no matter what David was facing or who was against him, that God cared for him and that God heard his cry. Psalm 34 and verse 6, David would say at another point, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. You understand there's not a trouble that God can't deliver you from. What do we know later in that same psalm, 
The Bible says in Psalm 34, 15, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open unto their cry. Yes, you curse God. Yes, you blame God. Yes, you, you get bitter and hateful toward God. Then don't expect that God will fulfill his plan because all of a sudden now everything is, is stalemated. Everything is stuck. But if I continue to trust in the mercy of God, I know God's got a plan for me. God cares for me like no other. He has a long history and, and he has a record of being merciful to me and I cannot forget that. And no one will understand me and know me and listen to me more than he will. He hears. God is never in a hurry and he's never late. Just when you and I can't go any further, he will save us out of our troubles for his honor and for his glory. So David said, I can trust. And then I want you to see one other realization that David had, I believe, that helped him to realize he could trust God's mercy. God knows me. God listens to me. And God has promised me that he would help me. I know we took several weeks to look at some of the promises of God, but the promises of God should not be dismissed. David realized God had made him promises. David was learning that the spiritual side of the law of thermodynamics was not always pleasant. The greater the heat, the greater the expansion. He's learning that God is working a plan in him because God promised that that's what he would do. David cries out to the God of promise, O oh Lord my God, Jehovah Elohim, the one who promised me that I would be king, the one who had me anointed to be king. I cry unto you, God was molding and making David to become a spiritual giant. It's been said that man's extremity is God's opportunity. When we are at our wit's end, without resources, at a loss for a way, perplexed, desperate, fatigued, frustrated, that's usually when we begin to see God work. See, David was learning this truth that God was more concerned with David's character than with David's complications. To be honest, we are more concerned about our complications. Hey, and if I learned something through this, great. But our priority is let's fix the complications. Let's get out of this, this difficult time. God's completely different. Complications, struggles, that's way down on God's list. He's more concerned about you and me to make us what he wants us to be, to fit his plan. And frankly, we all know it. Sometimes it's the complications that make us what we need to be in his plan. And David's learning that. David wanted him to change his circumstances, and God said, no, I want to change you. Can God snap a finger, say a word, and your life be exponentially better in mine? Absolutely. But would it allow us to be the men and the women that he wants us to be to fulfill his plan? Perhaps not. God made promises and those promises are, I'm working in you. And I'm going to do things in your life to make you what I need you to be. We know that verse very clearly. Romans 8, 28. Where Paul would say, we know that all things, all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. You know, God is too kind to be a jerk. 
He is too loving to be cruel. God is doing what he does to fulfill his great and glorious plan. And he has promised that is what he's doing. And he's promised that there is a method uh, to this madness, that there is a a, a reason to, to this rhyme, that there is an end to this journey. He's promised that. And he's promised that if we trust his mercies, it's all going to be for good. If I start trusting someone else or myself or other things, there is no guarantee that that will be for our good. But as long as I trust in the mercies of God, I have his promise. So David realizes this. That's what keeps him going day after day, after week, after month, after year. That God is doing what he does I can't explain it. I don't have an answer for it. I'm extremely frustrated by it, but I'm assured that nobody knows me and understands me and listens to me like God, and I have his promises that he is doing what he is doing for my good and for his glory. So what does he conclude? So I, verse 5, will trust in thy mercy. I'm just going to keep trusting you, God. In verse 6, I will give thanks and I will sing praise unto God. That I am going to just be thankful and praise you and trust you in my difficult times. Did God just snap a finger, wave a wand, and change everything? Not at all. But David realized that God was just as sure as delivering him from these circumstances as God had always been. The God who helped him defeat Goliath. The God who protected him time and time again. His circumstances had not changed, but he finally realized that God had not changed either. Remember these principles. God never changes. He's always the same. Everything else will change. You will change. Your circumstances will change. Your feelings will change. Your thoughts will change. Your body will change. Your friends will change. Everything will change except God. God is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. And the God who helped you yesterday and helped you a year ago, saved your soul in the past, is the same God who will work his plan today. Remember, before God does anything about our situation, he wants to do something about us. Think about that for a minute. Before God does anything about our situation, He wants to do something in us. He wants to develop our character. Then he'll deal with the complications of life. Here's another principle. God always does, and he always allows in our lives what he does to bring him honor and glory. It's not about your comfort. It's not about my ease. It's not about me understanding It's so that he looks big, so that a magnifying glass is on God. Because the world doesn't need Dan Schaefer, the world needs God. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 15, one of my favorite verses, Paul would say this, for all things, all things are for your sakes. Really? Yeah. So that the abundant grace, the grace that God gives, so that it might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of God. That God does what he does so that when, wow, I can't, I can't, he pours out his grace 
so that people see it and they think, how's that possible? So that then they look to him and he's glorified. So then Paul would later go on and say, so while we faint on the outside, our inward man's renewed day by day. David goes on. David says, I will keep trusting. I will keep praising. I will keep thanking. We say to God, hurry up. And God says, it's your move. I won't move until you move. Are you willing to say, okay, God, I will thank you. I will praise you. I will trust you. And let God do what God does for his honor and for his glory. He wants to teach us. He wants to change us. David knew if he trusted and obeyed that not only would his rejoicing and thanksgiving happen that day, but it would continue for days to come. Maybe today you're asking how long you're not enjoying the journey that you're on right now. But know this, if you know the Lord, you're not alone. And nobody knows and understands you and listens to you more than he. And no one has made you eternal promises like he has. So trust that he will show kindness and compassion. That he will grant strength and relief when we need it most and continue to praise him and thank him and trust him. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Almighty God, that relationship's only possible because of Jesus. But you have to repent, let go, turn from yourself and put your trust in him. He who was forsaken a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief died, was buried, and rose again for your sins and mine to forgive, to cleanse us so that we could have life and hope. First step of faith is to put your trust in him to be your savior. If you've never made that decision today, we'd love to talk with you about that. And if you have and you're a child of God, think about this. If I can trust him with my eternal soul, I can trust him with my daily life. Trust in the mercies of God. Amen? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heads are bowed. In a moment, we're going to have a verse of invitation. And you say, what is that? It's really just an opportunity for you and for me to kind of search our hearts. No, nobody's going to embarrass you by any means today. This is an opportunity for you and me in a moment of silence while we sit here. In a moment, we'll stand. Maybe you need to come and pray. Maybe you need to come and talk to somebody today. We have men, we have ladies that would talk with you, pray with you. Maybe today, as a Christian, you would admit your journey is difficult right now. And maybe it isn't, but you know as well as I that that difficulty will come again. Be encouraged today that nobody knows you. Nobody cares for you. Nobody understands you. Nobody listens to you better and more than God. He loved you so much that he died for you to provide life eternal. And he walks with you as a believer every single day. So trust him. Hold on to his promises. Thank him. Praise him. And you'll begin to see God do what he does. Will it be easy? No. But you'll see him work all things for our good. Today, I wonder if there are people here and you say, hey, pastor, just pray for me. I need prayer. Pray that, that I will trust the Lord as I need to in my life. Just remember to pray for me. With heads bowed, if that's you, just put your hand up quick and put it down. God bless you. Yep, all over the auditorium. Thank you. God bless you. Yep. You know, right there where you sit, in the moment when we stand, when you need to talk with someone, pray with someone, we're here to help. Nobody will listen more than he. Be encouraged. By the way, if you read the rest of the story, 
After 10 years, David becomes king. David goes home. David's reunited with his wife. David worships in the tabernacle. David becomes the greatest king that Israel has ever had. Was he a perfect man? No. But God kept his promise to David. And from the household and lineage of David, the Savior of the world was born. All things for our good. Today, put yourself in God's hands and trust him. Before we pray, I wonder, is there anybody here that would just say, hey, Pastor, I've never put my trust in him to be my savior. The God who loves you and cares for you and knows you better than you know yourself died for you so that you could live forever. He was buried and then he rose again, showing that he conquered death and hell. Today, if you've never put your trust in him, you can is there anybody here would say, I've never made that decision to trust him to be my savior. Pastor, would you pray for me? I'd like to make that decision in my life. Would you just slip a hand up and put it right back down so I can pray for you? God bless you. Thank you. Anybody else? In a moment, I'm going to pray and we're going to stand and Ryan's just going to kind of play and strum and we want to give you an opportunity to take a moment to search your heart, respond. And if God's speaking to you today, Maybe you need to talk to somebody, then you just come out. I'll be right down here at the front. You just come right down and say, Pastor, I need, I need to talk. I need to pray with somebody. I have questions. I need to put my trust in Jesus. Today, we would be honored. We would love the opportunity to sit and open a Bible and show you how you can have life eternal through Christ. If God's speaking to you today, I pray that you'll respond to his leading in your life. Let's stand for prayer. Can we do that? Dear Lord, I thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray you work in our hearts today. And Lord, I pray however you lead that we'll follow, help us to learn to trust in you. And I pray, Lord, for those who may have raised a hand, and even if they didn't, but Lord, they don't know you as Savior, I pray today they put their trust in you. Make that most important decision. Call upon you to be their Savior. Pray that they'll talk with somebody today. And Lord, those of us who know you as Savior, help us to know we can trust you along the journey of life. So Lord, help us to respond today in our life, we pray in Jesus' name. Heads are bowed just for a moment. Ryan's going to play. Let's just take a moment of silence and then we'll dismiss with prayer. Have you responded to God's leading today? I pray you have. Dear Lord, we thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your examples. Thank you for caring enough about us to teach us. And Lord, help us to know that if we can trust anybody in the world, we can trust you. So Lord, help us to do that, to continue to give thanks, to continue to praise your name. And Lord, uh, thank you. That what you do, you do, despite our failures and, Lord, despite our inadequacies, Lord, you love us. And, Lord, you can receive glory from our lives. I pray that we'll allow you to do what you do. And, Lord, help us um, to be faithful and trust you. So, Lord, we thank you for this time today. We could worship you. Lord, I pray as we dismiss that you would send us with your blessing. And Lord, I uh, pray for all the other events still would take place here today. Be honored in those. Get us home safely. Use us this week, Lord, uh, for your honor, for your glory. We pray be with our uh, mission team as they're flying home tonight. Keep them safe. 
And Lord, uh, we just thank you uh, for your great love for us. Thank you for your mercy. Help us to trust in you, we pray. So Lord, we ask all of these things. In the name of Jesus, we pray. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Hey, thank you for being here today. Be faithful if you're in town each week, and be praying for the team tonight. If you're parked in the funeral home, remember we got to be out by 1 o'clock. Young adults, there is group next door. We'll be over there by about 1, so or in the next uh, 15 minutes. So I hope you can hang out for that, okay? If you're visiting, stop at the Welcome Center. Thank you for being here today.